Hello, everyone. As I told you, this is our second meeting for uh, evolving our uh, week topics. And today, inshallah, we are going to discuss diabetes, hypertension, uh, blood disorders, and epilepsy, inshallah. So I need your cooperation, please. Uh, I know you have waited too long. So let's start. I need some answers so we can figure out the misconcept and correct it. Okay, excellent. So you all agree that this patient is high risk, right? So we are not going to offer the GTT in the first antenatal care visit or at the booking for everyone. We are going to offer it for patients who are at high risk. Excellent, doctor. She, she is saying that the screening is done between 24 and 28 weeks. Those only who are having high risk or they are having a history, like, for example, history of a previous macrosomic baby weighing 4.5 kilograms or more, family history of diabetes, especially if he's first degree relative, if they are of ethnicity with high prevalence of diabetes, like people in uh, Athena or um, let's say Egyptians or in the Mediterranean area, okay, those are having high prevalence of diabetes. And of course, if she is obese. So those exactly are the high risk population who need GTT to be done at booking. Excellent. And what would be the highest or the most effective risk factors for having GTM in this pregnancy? Choose one of those. This is a recall question, by the way. Excellent, a previous GDM. Yes, so if the patient is having a previous G GDM, she is going to be the highest risk among all those to have another GDM. Excellent. Okay, do, do you remember the recurrence risk? Or at least can, can you tell me, this is a recall question also, what would be the percentage or the risk percentage for uh, someone who is GDM now to be having type 2 diabetes after labor? Yes, Dr. Shirin, the previous 50%. one. 50%, yes, 50% of GDM patients are going to develop type 2 diabetes. This is a recall, take care. Okay, so here. What do you think? This patient is type 1 diabetic and she is suffering from proliferative retinopathy. She is anxious, of course, about the mode of delivery. She has no obstetric complications so far. So what do you think? Is it an indication for CS or instrumental delivery so i have seen many fours so and there are also some correct answers actually we are going to offer her normal vaginal delivery proliferative neutropathy is not an indication for elective cs okay and and this is why i brought this question because this is a misconcept and it's very familiar, by the way. There is a difference between proliferative retinopathy and hemorrhagic retinopathy. This is severe proliferative retinopathy when you have macular edema, okay, or vitreous hemorrhage. This is when the patient is not going to cope with the straining of labor. She cannot push. But here, only proliferative retinopathy is not a contraindication for vaginal delivery. Okay, guys, there is a difference between both of them. Unless she's having severe macular edema or vitreous hemorrhage, 
and I'm not any better family. They are saying recurrent one, of course. Okay, which which is coming from the retina. So this is when she's not going to cope with the uh the stress of the vaginal labor. Okay, the screening for GDM in current pregnancy for someone who was a previous GDM. When should that be? The previous one? Okay. Okay, by the way, those are recalls. Okay, so, so here we are. She had a previous GDM. And take care, this could come like EMQ with 16 options. With so many numbers. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking for what? I'm looking for booking. Yes, excellent. She is a previous GDM, so I'm going to look for booking. And if it's negative, I'm going to repeat it again by 24 to 28 weeks. Excellent, guys. What about this one? This pregnant woman who developed GDM in her current pregnancy wants to know how she would be followed up after delivery. Still getting some correct answers, so th this is amazing. So, so th did you get what what kind of question they like to examine you? They like to examine you in every follow up, any follow up, guys. Maternal medicine is all about follow up, mode of delivery, how you are going to choose the correct contraception. For this woman with uh, um, a specific disorder, okay, and of course, who's part and follow up if she is diabetic or hypertensive, and so on. So here, okay, we are going to do fasting blood sugar at six to thirteen weeks, okay, then yearly hemoglobin A one C. So the correct answer is A. Excellent. We are not going to depend on the OGTT to follow up a patient after delivery. GTT is only used to diagnose GDM. Okay, but now the woman have has already delivered. So I want to know if she's still having high blood sugar or not. So I'm going to use the, the fasting blood sugar, okay, between 6 to 13 weeks when I'm expecting that her metabolism and insulin resistance now has resolved. Excellent. Okay, here we are. This, this is the part from the NICE guideline. Postpartum follow-up, of course. Regarding offering lifestyle advice and so on. You are going to offer her the fasting plasma glucose test, as we said. And after 13 weeks, uh, if the fasting plasma glucose is not has done earlier, we are going to do a hemoglobin A1C. And then hemoglobin A1C every year. Okay, what about this one? Okay, this one is tricky, by the way. This one is tricky, and I'm going to tell you why. They are asking about a pregnant woman with type 1 diabetes. She came for antenatal care in the first trimester. She is well controlled, and she is asking about insulin requirements in pregnancy. Dr. Sana, excellent. Excellent, Dr. Farah. You are in the meeting.
Okay, so here, guys, they are asking in general, someone who is pregnant and she's taking insulin, how would you maximize the benefit uh, or uh, the control of her blood sugar? Generally speaking, nothing should be changed from the preconceptional period if the woman is well controlled. This is generally speaking. Of course, when she's going to meet her uh, diabetes doctor, uh, the endocrinologist, I mean, and the dietitian, and uh, us, of course, as obstetrician, all together we are going to, to form MDC. In the MDC meeting, we are going to see the trend of her blood sugar. If she is well controlled, so she can still on the same doses she was preconceptionally. When we find her uncontrolled, we are going to increase something, decrease something, or do something about her diet. Okay, what you are saying, Dr. Rafah and Dr. Omukulsum, this is going to apply for insulin pumps. And yes, you are correct also regarding regular insulin. Okay, but it, it should be according to her diet, not because she's pregnant. So this is different from another question, which is becoming a recent record, and it's so trendy. It, it has been appearing like for the past three or four exams. Okay? which is this one. This one. This is the recent record. So I'm getting a lot of these. Increase in long acting insulin. Okay, guess what? Surprise, there is no long acting insulin for those who are using insulin pump therapy. Insulin pump depends mainly on short acting insulin. And the patient is going to have her shot after eating much carbs or when she feels that um, she, she has something that she's not supposed to have, like she, she had an extra piece of cake. She had a Coke because she uh, was with her friends and so on. So she's going to have extra dose by applying uh, the button, okay? But the insulin pump therapy depends only on short acting. So yes, here we are. We are going to increase the rapid insulin. Okay, there is no intermediate acting insulin in pregnancy. We are going to increase the rapid insulin. Okay. Which is called the bag ground insulin. So in the exam, they, they can ask you about the basal dose. Basal dose or bag ground dose. They mean the rapid acting insulin. Okay, this one is going to be increased. Why so? Because as you know, there is a state of insulin resistance during pregnancy. Right? Especially, especially if this woman is having rising fasting and preprandial values. So I'm going to increase the basal dose, okay? 
and it's going to be emitted by the pump all through the day. This is one. Number two, if she's having a, a, a meal time, as I said, it, it was full of carbs, she was out, uh, she was a, uh, in a birthday or whatever. We are going to tell her, and it, it needs a hell of education, by the way. Using the insulin pump is not easy. It's not an easy job. It needs taking a course. Okay, so the NHS is offering a course for women who are uh, who optioned for using the insulin pump. And when they make sure that she can use the pump and know how it's working and how she's going to increase the doses according to her diet and so on, then she can have the pump. Okay, so here we are. They are saying previously one unit of insulin would be sufficient to cover 12 brands of carbohydrates. During pregnancy, this one unit will be only adequate for three grams. So this is why we are increasing the background dose. Take care that there is no long-acting insulin to protect her. So if something happened to the pump or disconnected or malfunctioned or the patient is not really aware how to use it maximally, this patient is going to be at risk for diabetic ketoacidosis, even only after a very short period of time. Because she mainly depends on those shots of rapid acting insulin. The pump is going to give her like shots, shots all over the day. By the way, we have two types of pumps. The old one was manually automated. Like she's going to increase the dose. And uh, whenever she needs extra dose, she's going to give it to herself. The new one is automatic. It's, it's going to monitor the blood glucose in her blood and give her the essential dose of insulin. So this, is, this one is great, of course. And usually, usually I have seen it with kids. Because of course, kids are not going to be aware when to give themselves like others. So this one is, is amazing. It's it monitors the blood glucose and accordingly, it's going to give the shot when needed. Okay, what about during labor? This is very important uh, things to notice. If you are having a patient with insulin pump, they, they call it continuous uh, subcutaneous insulin uh, releaser, this one. Her pump should be left untouched. And you are going to call someone who is expert in uh, in diabetes and insulin pump to, to uh, ask them what should be done efficiently for having the great control of blood sugar during labor. She's not going to be controlled like other women. Okay, guys, did, you got the difference between this question and the previous one? Okay, excellent. And by the way, as I told you, this one here, this is a recall, the one for, for the pump. And the one, this one is from Dr. Andrew Caesar's book. Okay, which should be nothing is going to change if the patient is well controlled. We are going to play with the diet, not with the insulin. Okay, and you know what we really, really fear of? Not, not the fasting glucose. We fear of the postprandial glucose. So this is for your own practice. Even patients with diabetes, you are going to find the fasting blood glucose normal or even hypoglycemic, but they are going to have high postprandial glucose, two-hour postprandial. Why? 
because of the insulin resistance status during pregnancy. This is why. Okay. This one is also good. We are having this woman. She is having her fourth baby. She is type 2 diabetes. She was taking metformin. Yeah, sure. Prior to pregnancy for glycemic control. Uh, from 32 weeks gestation, isofan insulin was added twice daily. In addition to metformin, isofan is... Uh, a short acting insulin, okay, to achieve glycemic control, which is by the way recommended by NICE. If you are going to add insulin to achieve glycemic control, it should be short acting one. The woman is planning to breastfeed. What advice should be given with regard to hypoglycemic agent in the postnatal period? I'm going to get you the, the previous question after answering this. Okay, first of all, I need I need to know, do you think metformin is contraindicated during breastfeeding? It's not contraindicated during pregnancy, right? Okay, but she was on two things from 32 weeks. She was on metformin and short-acting insulin. Now she's postpartum, so take care. It's different. It's different. Plus, she's going to breastfeed. Breastfeed means a lot of energy is going to be consumed. A lot of calories are going to be burned. Breastfeeding is very very uh, good way to lose calories not for me i don't know why but it, it it didn't work for me okay so yeah breastfeeding should burn a lot of calories so we have a fear of hypoglycemia so which one we are going to continue with Well, I'm serious. It didn't work for me. Maybe, maybe because I, I, I was like eating chocolate like hell. Okay, I got so many answers. Let's see. Okay, we are having a fear of the increased risk of hypoglycemia during breastfeeding. Right, and now she's not having the same insulin resistance state. So we have a general rule. If the woman is having GDM and she was taking insulin during pregnancy, we are going to advise her to stop all insulin immediately after birth. And she should go back to the regimen as per pre-pregnancy. Of course, metformin is safe. Metformin is safe. This is the only oral drug that is uh, uh, okay or allowed to be taken during pregnancy from the all oral hypoglycemic drugs. There is another one, but, but not really approved by the FDA or let's say not really approved by our college. So it's not really mentioned in the NICE guideline, but there is another one. So metformin is great. I even remember uh, a patient of mine, she was totally controlled only on metformin throughout the pregnancy. And she was really pleased by this, that she's not going to take insulin. Okay, the previous one for, uh, for those who asked for this one. I think it's a mess, Dr. Khan. Then, okay. This is a talk article. It's called Insulin Pump in Pregnancy. Okay. 
So we are going to stop the insulin and advise metformin as per pre-pregnancy with monitoring, of course, of blood sugar. Okay. Now the sickle cell disease. So while you were revising the sickle cell, as like any maternal medicine topic, you should ask yourself, what should I do with this woman preconceptionally? What would I do as extra care antenatally? Any extra care intrapartumly? And what should I choose for her as a contraception in the postpartum period? Is there any special follow-up for her or for the baby? If you have answered those questions, you have covered the whole topic. So excellent, excellent. So the eye test that she needed to know about is retinal screening. What else should we screen for, for women with speckle cell disease? This is the whole, uh, the whole about sickle cell is making sure that her condition is not going to get worse during pregnancy or making any complication. This patient is, is having a state of vaso occlusive state and thrombotic state and already pregnancy is hypercoagulable state. So we need to screen for renal dysfunction, liver dysfunction, cardiac, don't, don't, yes, don't forget about the cardiac function and pulmonary hypertension. Yes, excellent. And like any other woman during pregnancy, we are going to screen for UTI, we are going uh, to screen for the APO and the antibodies, right? Like any other woman during pregnancy, we are going to screen for the VTE risk. And this woman in particular is having high risk for VTE. So if only she's having sickle cell with no other risk factors, do you recommend to give her low molecular weight heparin? If yes, when you are going to start it. Excellent, Dr. Sidra. Yes, if there is no other risk factor, only because she's having sickle cell, I'm going to start it from 28 weeks. But if she's having extra risk factors, I would start it from the very first day. And because we have a general rule, any woman who took low molecular weight heparin during pregnancy, she's going to need it for six weeks postpartum. This is a general rule. For whatever reason, she took the low molecular weight heparin during pregnancy. She is going to need it again postpartum for six weeks. Right? Okay, so here the written screening, of course. Okay, what about this one? Which one is true? Yes, yes, excellent, excellent. Okay, let's, ha let's have a line line. Cardiac failure is the most common cause of death, right? Puberty is delayed because of the thalassemia, because of the repeated transfusion. Repeated blood transfusion and iron chelation are the cornerstone of management. Splenectomy is not the mainstay of modern treatment, of course. We, we reserve this for those who are having splenomegaly because of the repeated transfusion only. So the one that is really correct, that MRI now helped us to reduce the mortality. How? By screening for the iron overload. 
this is a problem not only in thalassemia but also for sickle cell especially those who need transfusion not all patients with sickle cell need transfusion okay but still we are at risk for hemolysis microcytic anemia so there is iron overload sometimes in their blood and it, it could precipitate anywhere especially the heart and the liver so we have to we have cardiac monitoring which is cardiac t2 mri and we have the ferry scan which is the uh, liver uh, iron overload mri okay uh, let me ask you something if you are going to choose a screening method for the cardiac function for someone who is having sickle cell would it be echo or MRI or CT or chest x-ray or uh, uh, vacuum scan Yes, excellent. Echo, echo, Dr. Adij, not MRI. Echo, I, I'm, I'm going to use the MRI to screen for iron overload. Iron overload, not cardiac function. Cardiac function assessment is a must before getting pregnant. If she's coming to you in the preconception care and she is embarking on pregnancy, what you should do as a good physician is to make sure that her heart is going to make it through pregnancy. We're going to talk about this when, when we have a, a long discussion about cardiac disorders in pregnancy. I need to make sure that this woman is not WHO3 or 4, or NIHAS3 or 4, or else I'm going to Tell her you should not get pregnant. This would be what? This would be cardiomegaly, severe cardiomegaly, or pulmonary hypertension, right? Or aortic dilatation, more than four to five, according to her condition. So there are some, I'm not going to say diseases, there are some specifications in, in the echo. If it's positive, I'm going to ask her not to get pregnant. No, you are not willing to, to uh, tolerate pregnancy. So echo is a must, and it should be done within at least one year from getting pregnant. So this is a very cool question. If you are having a woman with sickle cell, okay, and she has done her echo, uh, from 14 months, what would be your advice or what would be your next step for this woman? For, forget about the question. Tell me, because this is a recall, a recent recall, and it's very trendy. Her last echo is from 14 months. What's going to be the next step? Yes, excellent. Repeat the echo because I need her recent, most recent echo to be, yes, only one year back, not more one year back. So I got some correct answers here. How, how you are going to offer her the folic acid? You are going to offer her high dose folic acid throughout pregnancy yes excellent whether she was sickle cell or thalassemia of course are you going to give her iron she's having microcytic anemia so what do you think no not routinely yes i'm going to do a ferritin test First, and if it's below 30, like any other pregnant woman, I'm going to give her iron. Keep in your mind the burden of iron. Okay, we screen for iron overload. We stopped 
the chelation therapy once she gets pregnant. So this is why I'm not going to give her iron unless she really, really need it. Which chelation therapy is accepted during pregnancy? Desferoxamine, excellent. And during breastfeeding also, this one is the only one acceptable. Excellent, guys. Okay, here we are. We are having a patient who is admitted at 30 weeks. She's having severe pain in her hips. A diagnosis of acute pain for sickle cell crisis has been made. What is the most important immediate management? I, I have a focus today on emergency situations and because they like it the most during exam. She's having acute painful sickle cell crisis. Okay. So I'm going to ask myself, what should I give her as a management for the crisis? Do you remember the infograph for, for sickle cell crisis? The first thing is to make sure that her airway is good, breathing is good, circulation is good, ABC as any kind of emergency. Then I'm going to give her painkillers. Okay. According to the WHO analgesia ladder, this question is tricky because the scenario is really short. So you may miss that this woman is having severe pain. They didn't tell me, okay, about the pain score, which is, by the way, this is what should be done. I should make a pain score. Okay, using pain score chart and make my mind which pain killer she needs. So can we give her only steroids, non-steroids, I mean? Yes. Can we give her only paracetamol? Yes, if she's having mild pain. And take care when you are going to use the non-steroids. It shouldn't be used in the first trimester or after 31 weeks. I'm, I'm talking now in general, not, not in this case. I'm talking in general. Pethidin is totally avoided, of course. And you know, such a question could be EMQ with hell of choices. And, th and this is why I find it tricky, because it's easy, but you are going to miss the beset severe pain. Severe pain means I need opioids. And it shouldn't be IV. It, it could be oral opioids. So this scenario could be more difficult. If I added that this woman is having vomiting. So now I'm going to look behind any oral opioid or any oral analgesic and search for IV analgesia, right? Okay, what if one of the choices was, um, was including blood transfusion? with the same very scenario, would you choose it or not? No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. We are not going for blood transfusion unless, yes, unless she's having acute chest syndrome among the crisis or for any other reason, or she's not responding to the treatment. 
okay? So it would be exchange transfusion, not top up transfusion. Excellent, Dr. Rafa. This would be exchange transfusion, not top up transfusion. I'm saying this, guys, because this could be E and Q. And it could be complex. There's many details uh, among the scenario itself. So here it's, it, it should be very easy. This is sickle cell crisis with severe pain. Okay. And severe means opioid. So yes, the best one here would be admission, rapid assessment, and morphine. Yeah, I'm just saying, Dr. Sundas, I'm, I'm just saying if the exchange transfusion was here. I, I wouldn't choose it also. Okay, so here we are. I'm going to give you time if you want it. I need you to know by heart the management of sickle cell crisis. This is emergency situation, and it's all about pain, pain, pain. So it's all about pain management. After A, B, C, it's totally different from acute chest syndrome alone. So the woman could have crisis plus acute chest syndrome, definitely. The acute chest syndrome turned to be or complicated by crisis. But she could have acute chest syndrome alone. Do you know the criteria of acute chest syndrome? If she is having respiratory manifestations like chest pain, coughing, plus new pulmonary infiltrate in the chest X-ray. Hypoxia, yes. But there is no pain. There is no joint pain. There is no bone pain. There is no abdominal pain. It's all respiratory problems. So if she's having pain, it would be chest only. Acute chest syndrome, having the same picture of pneumonia and the same picture of pulmonary embolism, the same picture. So you must exclude the pulmonary embolism and treat her like pneumonia. She's going to be given antibiotics, oxygen if she is hypoxic, right? And if she is not responding to both of them, I'm going to do the exchange transfusion in very severe cases. Here, as you can see, I'm going to do a rapid initial assessment. I'm going to... Uh, make my mind about the pain severity. I'm going to choose which kind of analgesia to give her. Of course, it's going to depend on the woman preference and the local expertise and what's available there. But for severe pain, keep in your mind, I have to go for opioids. Opioids allowed during pregnancy is morphine, diamorphine, oxycodone. Okay, in breastfeeding, it's totally different story. So drugs during uh, antenatal care and postpartum is, is very, very important topic. This is a talk article, by the way. Okay, don't forget about A, B, C. So if I have here within the choices, another choice that includes Oxygen, definitely I'm going to choose it. Definitely. If, if this one, this one here, oxygen, hydration, morphine, this would be the best. The best one. Okay. So another special thing about sickle cell is vaccination. So what do you think? How often should the pneumococcal vaccine be administrated to ensure that she is protected? Five years, excellent. 
what about the new new mucoccal vaccine and meningococcal sorry this is one of the vaccinations that are recommended to be given for uh, a woman with sickle cell mm, yearly not only once do you know that we we or in in most of our countries we have the meningococcal vaccine as a part of routine vaccination during school. So if she has not, uh, hasn't taken, sorry, uh, the meningococcal vaccine in, in routine prophylaxis, she should take it. It's, it's only given once. Influenza, on the other hand, as, as Dr. Sedra is saying, this one should be yearly because the strains are going to be different. Every year, influenza is different. Right? Great. What else is very special about sickle cell? Another kind of prophylaxis should be given for those women all through pregnancy. Do you remember which one? Excellent. Yes. Antibiotic prophylaxis. And according to the latest guideline, they said it's going to be uh, according not to us, it's according to the uh, facility and according to uh, cultures and according to rheumatologists, but mainly penicillin is going to be given. And if there is a resistance to penicillin, they are going to search for another one. But generally speaking, we are going to start with penicillin throughout pregnancy. Excellent, guys. I'm so proud of you, Allah. No, no, they didn't, they didn't mention this. They didn't mention if she's having allergy, what, what kind of antibiotics we are going to give her. So I'm not going to assume that erythromycin is going to work. Here we are. Yes, we are having a beta thalassemia major patient. Cardiac function is okay. She has had a splenectomy. Okay. Platelets are good. Hemoglobin is not bad. Serum fructosamine. Why we do serum fructosamine? This is monitoring for what? Yes, which organ? Liver, pancreas. Yes, yes, pancreas. Th this is one of the tests that we are going to screen for pancreas state. Remember, iron overload, iron toxication to the organ. So for the liver, the ferry scan, for the heart, the scan by the MRI, for the pancreas serum fructosamine. Right? For the spleen, by the way, usually they, they search for splenomegaly. Uh, forget about the Nurni Valley. Forget about it. Here we are having the key word. The key word is she has had a splenomectomy. So this woman must have repeated transfusion. Right? That means that she is transfusion dependent thalassemia major. In this case, aspirin alone is not going to work. She needs both aspirin and low molecular weight heparin. Right, yeah, and Dr. Sidra said uh, 650 platelets. 
okay, I, I consider this okay because of the splenectomy, of course. You're going to have heart breaks in the movement. Right? Yes, of course, we are having high risk state here. So we are going to need both low molecular weight heparin and low dose aspirin. Excellent. So here we are, a case of thrombocytopenia. And they told you already that this woman is having ICP, idiopathic immune thrombocytopenia. So what do you know about ICP? Is it something related to pregnancy or it's a disorder that was already there before pregnancy? Actually, ITP is a disorder that was already there before pregnancy. It's not gestational thrombocytopenia. Gestational thrombocytopenia is something related to pregnancy. The woman was okay before pregnancy. There is no history of bruises, no history of ataxis. Everything was okay. And even during pregnancy, she's having no symptoms. But incidentally, when you are doing the TBC, you have found that platelets are below 100. This is gestational thrombocytopenia. ITP is a condition that was already there, but usually it causes mild symptoms, like easily bruising, like hemorrhage when she uh, got hit, like losing much blood when she loses a piece, epistaxis. Something looks like bone will blood disease, mild bone will blood disease. During pregnancy, this woman is going to come to us with symptoms. Again, she's going to say, I'm, I'm having easily bruising. Okay, and now the platelets are below 100. So th this kind uh, of thrombocytopenia it's not related to pregnancy. It's not because of pregnancy. But because it's autoimmune, of course, the symptoms and signs are going to be altered during pregnancy. So what do you think? Which one is true? An instrumental delivery is contraindicated. Regional anesthesia is contraindicated should be treated with immunosuppressants. Neonatal thrombocytopenia occur in 25% of cases. Delivery by CS at 37. Okay, I'm, I'm going through one by one because each one is really good. Should be treated by immunosuppressants? Actually, yes, but for severe cases. So is this one severe? No, she's having platelet 70 and severe cases are the one who is below 50. Okay, regional anesthesia is contraindicated? Actually, yes, because I need at least 80 count of platelets to have a safe regional anesthesia, whether it was final or epidural. Instrumental delivery is contraindicated? Actually, yes, in general, but not here. Not here. Okay, because she's having a platelet count of 70, and 70 is okay to have a vaginal delivery and an instrumental delivery. Deliver by CS at 37 weeks? No. Vaginal delivery is not contraindication because she's having ICP. She's going to bleed also by CS, whether this or that. She's going to bleed by both. 
So I'm, I'm just going to take my, my care as much as I can during vaginal delivery, not to have harsh manipulation, to be ready for any vaginal bleeding, right? I'm not going to uh, uh, use instrumental delivery as much as I can according to the place of count. Okay, and there, there, there is no specific time to deliver this woman. She can deliver by trust normally. Okay, so the trick here is the platelet count. This is the trick in, in, in this question. Here we are having ICP. Okay, so I'm going to avoid ventos as much as I can because ventos can cause neonatal intraventricular hemorrhage. Okay, forceps or any instrumented delivery should be avoided, especially if the woman is having really low platelets, right? Do you remember what is the threshold for having a vaginal delivery? Twenty, not not this low. Forty. Fifty for, for uh, epidural or spinal anesthesia or regional anesthesia. Uh, Eighty, sorry. So yeah, yeah. Vaginal delivery more than fifty. Yes. Final answer here. What do you think? She's having seventy. Can, can she have a regional anesthesia? No, so the, the correct one here is regional anesthesia is contraindicated. For vaginal delivery, at least at least 40 to 50. According to, to our, our resources, the college resources, 50. This one is regional anesthesia is contraindicated, guys. Okay, let, let me show you something. Okay, so here we are. This one, you got it all correct. It's sodium valproate. Excellent, what kind, why she should use contraception? Okay, the highest risk of breakthrough seizures. You know, the postpartum period is the worst. The worst in everything. The worst in breakthrough seizures. The worst in VTE. The worst in uh, someone with rheumatoid arthritis. Many of autoimmune disorders, not only rheumatoid arthritis, except for systemic lupus. So, so really, the postpartum period is like hell. The worst for mental health disorders also. So yes, yes, the highest risk for breakthrough seizures is postpartum. Yes, excellent. Okay, this one. The woman was controlled by lamotrigine and she delivered spontaneously. She schemed to breastfeed her baby. Her last fitting episode was two months prior to pregnancy, which is amazing. She was uh, episode free throughout pregnancy. What advice would you give her? You remember the general rule I was talking about? If the patient is controlled on one agent, 
do not stop this agent. You should um, search for another resort. Search for another thing. Yes, excellent guys, excellent guys. She should consider breastfeeding prior to taking Glamotrigin dose. And why so? Because Glamotrigin can easily pass during breastfeeding. This is why. Even in minimal amount, but it can reach the baby. So the best thing is to minimize the exposure. How we are going to do this? By breastfeeding before taking her dose. What would be the side effects of uh, uh, Lamotrigin or the baby if he is exposed to, the, to Lamotrigin? Drowsiness? Poor suckling? up to apnea, some rashes. So if, if any of those appear on the baby, we should measure the serum levels to rule out toxicity. Is my voice clear, guys? Okay, good. So I need you to take a moment and read the question and take your time. You should have the correct answer inside your head and search for it within the options. This is the best way to answer EMQ. When you get your answer, go through all the options. Maybe there is better option than the one you have found. This woman is having tonic clonic seizures in labor. She refused to have epidural. She is taking Intonox, which is get an air for pain relief. She started having seizures and was given intravenous lorazepam. And she was given another dose of lorazepam after 10 minutes. But the seizures continue and continue. Amazing, mashallah. Most of you know the correct answer. If I'm having fail control to the seizures, I should go to the next line. The next line would be phenytoin. Excellent. Phenytoin is given IV. Excellent, guys. Excellent. Okay. So why it's, why not diazepam? Who who is going to be very clever to answer this? Yes, Doctor Sedra, excellent. No, not because of the mode of administration. Because. Diazepam and lorazepam are from the same class. So either this or this was given. You should go for another family. You should go for phenytoin. Because I have seen many candidates answer diazepam. If she's not on intravenous lorazepam, if she was given oral lorazepam, uh, whatever, I am. Okay, so they would choose diazepam. No, diazepam is from the same family, and you are going to choose it if the woman is having contraindication for IV. For whatever reason, she's not having IV line. And they mentioned clearly in the scenario that the patient is not having IV line. So yeah, I can go for rectal diazepam. Why? Because I cannot give her IV drug while she's having a seizure. Very difficult. 
got it? Okay, the, the management of status epileptics during labor is a must, a must. You should know the, the steps by heart. Okay, here. This patient with epilepsy on sodium valproate presented in preconception clinic asking about other anti-epileptic drugs. You would tell her that Lamotrigine is. I have a reason for bringing this question. And take care because it's very tricky and it's an exact exam question. I wouldn't choose no known association with congenital malformation. I wouldn't choose it because there is one to 2% risk for having congenital malformation. And there is a difference between option five and seven, by the way. There is a difference. Five is saying that there is lower risk of subsequent cognitive and neurodevelopmental disorders. Seven is saying limited evidence to link it with neurodevelopmental abnormalities. Seven means we still have no idea or we still have very limited evidence, uh, scientific based one, to link it with neurodevelopmental abnormalities. Number five is saying for sure that there is lower risk than other agents for neurodevelopmental problems. There is a huge difference between option five and seven. Okay, I, I, I wouldn't choose one or two or three or four. Which one is associated with hypostasis? Which agent? Sodium valproate, excellent. Okay, which one is having higher incidence of autism? Yes, again, sodium valproate. Okay, which one is associated mostly with neurotube defect? Phenytoin. Yes, no, phenytoin. Phenytoin with cordic, yes, and neurotube defects also. Both of them. Okay, so we are between five and seven. Let's see. Based on evidence. Okay, we have very little evidence for what? For levitrectam and phenytoin. That it has long-term outcomes on children. Okay, and we have limited evidence that carpamazine lamotrigine could adversely affect neurodevelopmental uh, state of the offspring. This is limited evidence. That does not mean that I'm having clear, clear state. I, I shouldn't say out loud until now. Let, let's see. Let's see. In Epilepsy Talk 2017, they said what? Lamotrigine and Levitractin are recommended as first line agents in patients who would otherwise be considered for sodium valproate. Why so? Because they have lower rate of monotherapy associated with their use or congenital malformation. And due to lower risk 
of subsequent cognitive and neurodevelopmental problems. So yeah, I'm, I'm having a clear state now that lamotrigine and levetractam are having lower risk of subsequent cognitive and neurodevelopmental problems, lower than other agents. Sodium valproate, as Dr. Sedra said, is the highest risk for congenital malformation in general and especially the neurotube defects. And of course, we have increased risk of cognitive disabilities. Dr. Farah is saying which one is associated with small for gestational age. This is not mentioned in the guideline or the top article. This is mentioned in uh, the Mahara guideline for epileptic medication. Actually, there are two. Phenytoin and topiramate. I, I can send you a screenshot from it. I, I think I'm having it here somewhere. Okay, as you can see, the phenobarbital here has the highest risk of babies being born for small for gestational age. Yes, yes, dear, I would. I would know. Phenytoin. Non-clinical studies report that use of phenytoin can affect fetal growth. Topiramate. Babies more likely to be born with low birth weight and small for gestational age. So in general, if we if we want to combine them, and it was combined in the Mehra report also, here we are about the risk of neurodevelopmental disorders, and the other one was the risk for intrauterine growth restriction. I, I can send this to the group. This one said it all. Okay, as you can see here. Okay, for um gabapentin no not this one you never ask about brigabine or gabapentin we want what we want carpamazepine it was mentioned in one of the recalls but uh, i'm sure it, it's not uh, a correct record okay uh, carpamazepine does not appear a, 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 a great clear statement does not appear to be associated with increased risk on neurodevelopmental delay. Why phenobarbital, phenytoin? Inconsistent findings. However, the data support possibility of adverse effects. And as I told you, in the top article, they mentioned clearly that lamotrigine and levitractam has smaller or lower risk for neurodevelopmental disorders. So I, I think now everything is clear. I'm going to send this to your group right now. Okay, which one is affected with increased rate of child autism or forced sodium valproate? This is a recall also. And they love, they love, they love the question of status epilepticus, this one. How you are going to manage status epilepticus during pregnancy. Okay, so please forget, uh, remember, Dazepam, Midazolam, Lorazepam, all are the same family. If the seizures are not controlled, we are going to consider phenytoin or phosphenytoin. Which one is better? If both of them are within the options, which one you would choose?
Anyone? Yes, post-finite only because this is the active form. This is the active form. Excellent, Dr. Alda. Post-finite only is much better than finite only. This is the active form of finite only. So if both of them were there within the options, go for post-finite only. And the those, unfortunately, you have to remember it because sometimes the options include the dose. Okay? The dose of magnesium sulfate or finite oil, you should know it because they are emergency medication. Okay, guys? So here we are before I forget, I'm sending it to the group. Let's get back to our questions. Let's get back to the question where we are. Yes, here. Okay, we are about to finish. This, this is great. We are going to talk about hypertension now. Which I also choose some common recalls and some emergency one also. So what do you think? Can you see the question? Okay. Excellent. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, great. So, why you have chosen Nifedipin? Nifedipin first and then Amlodipine, Dr. Manico. Yes, because of the plaque affinity. This agent is the preferable one. Yeah, okay. If she is she was postpartum hypertensive patient and she is of Caucasian ethnicity, or they didn't mention the ethnicity, what would be the preferred Asian during postpartum period? Inalapril. Excellent. Yes, inalapril is the most preferred one. Okay, excellent God. If she was having severe asthma or uncontrolled asthma, or she's having a recurrent cough, or now she's having cough, are you going to give her inalapril? No. Severe asthma, no. Uncontrolled asthma, no. Mild or controlled asthma, yes, we can consider inalapril. In this case, I'm going to avoid beta blockers like labitalol. I'm going to avoid inalapril, of course. And I'm going to be left with nifedipine. Those are common recalls. Common recalls. And take care if the scenario is saying mild asthma controlled or uncontrolled okay because inalapril in case of mild asthma or controlled asthma is not absolute contraindication and this is the the only one of its family that can be used here okay ace inhibitors are totally contraindicated during pregnancy this one could be and they are totally contraindicated in postpartum this is the only one that can be used Okay, here, here we are. We are having a woman who has delivered at 35 weeks due to preeclampsia. Uh, she's having ongoing hypertension and she suffered from asthma. She has never been hospitalized. What would be the most appropriate antihypertensive agent? Yeah, I know that in the book it 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 was answered in a lapreli. Uh, I'm sorry. 
Okay, this woman is not having severe asthma. She's not having severe asthma, okay? And you have just said that postpartum B, the best agent to control hypertension is enalapril. Right? So why not to give her enalapril? This is the idea here. And they mentioned she has never been hospitalized. That means that she's not having severe asthma. The side effect of enalapril is cough. Mas there is no bronchoconstriction, not like no, not like beta blockers, of course. Inalapril is calcium channel blocker. Beta blockers, not all of them. The the non-selective one, like labitalol. Labitalol is non-selective. Okay, non-selective means that it can work on uh, alpha receptors and beta receptors. I'm not going to to do pharmacology here. So it causes bronchoconstriction. This is why it's totally contraindicated in any kind of asthma. And not to forget, labitalol causes tachycardia. Tachycardia with someone who is asthmatic can be like having asthma. When he feels his heart racing, it makes him not feeling good to breathe. Yes, inalapril is allowed in controlled asthma or mild asthma. And here is the trick. Okay, so for, forget about the answer uh, in the book. You are going for part three, inshallah, and it's, it's going to be a common question and discussion with, with, with the examiner. Here, and I need you to take care of what you are going to choose. We are having a primary gravida. She is of African origin. Obese, of course. Attend the emergency department because of shortness of breast. Edema. Tachycardia. She has no proteinuria, but admits to a family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It becomes apparent she is hypertensive. This is severe or not? 153 over 100. No, it's not severe. Okay. And needs treatment prior to investigation. Which of the following antihypertensive would be most appropriate? Okay, we have a puzzle here. We have a puzzle. This woman has African origin. Okay, I would go for nifedipin. Right? But there is another trick. This woman is edematous and she's having family history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is this woman could be having heart failure. She's risky for having heart failure. We don't know yet. Yes, excellent nifadipin is contraindicated in cases of acute heart failure. Excellent. And here's the trick. So I need an agent that can give me control for the hypertension and at the same time, at the same time, it's not vasodilating agent. Right? And this woman is asthmatic. She's asthmatic? They said she's asthmatic? No, she's having shortness of breath. So I'm not going to give her labitalol. Amlodipine is not used for acute or emergency cases. Yeah, Dr. Azda is screaming. She's screaming and... 
in majuscule uh, letters. Yes, she, this woman should could be having hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Give her a diuretic. Yeah, yes, and I agree. <laughs> I agree, but guess what? A hydralazine, which you, you want to give her, is going to promote hyperdynamic circulation. And it shouldn't be given for someone who could have adverse cardiac function. This is why I, 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 I was searching for asthma and no, she's not asthmatic. So why not to give her the load? She can have IV the load. Yeah, so what? Hypertension is really tricky, you know why? Because we have some concepts that for this condition I could I should give this. For this condition I should give this. And it's not it's not like this. You know that in even in severe hypertension, you can try oral labitalol first. I, I want to show you the nice guideline itself. Yeah, you can start by, by oral labitalol, not the IV. In some cases. Okay, here I'm having some problems, which is the cardiac problem, right? So the cardiac problem is going to make me go away from nifedipine, go away from hydralazine, right? And amlodipine is, is not a first-line antihypertensive. It takes time. Missile dopa, the same. It, it takes weeks to control. So, yeah, I, I, I want to go through this with you. This is very important, guys. I think I have opened it here. We can see it together. Um, I have sent it also to the group. So the visual. Uh, the visual algorithms for for hypertension. Called visual summaries. Here we are. Okay, and I'm going to choose. The one for uh, critical care. Let me share the screen. This one, you can see it now. Okay, so at, at first, they are telling you the levels of preeclampsia and hypertension because each one of them is going to need a special place for care. Okay, now what about the medical management? See here? See here? You can treat the admitted woman to critical care during pregnancy or after birth immediately with one off. Levitalol, oral or IV. It's a clinical judgment. Oral nifedipine, IV hydralazine. But take care. IV hydralazine to be given, it needs something plus hydralazine. Hydralazine could not be given alone. You should give her crystalloids before or at the same time of giving hydralazine. Do you think a woman with a cardiac problem, she could manage taking IV fluids? No, this is totally contraindicated and the patient is edematous. This patient could be having heart failure. So this is why hydralazine is not the best agent for her. Okay, as you can see here, here in the fluid balance and volume expansion. For, for uh, first to say, the woman in the scenario is not having severe preeclampsia. Anyway, if I'm having a woman with severe preeclampsia, 
I'm going to limit the fluid to 80 milli per hour. This is general rule. Any woman with preeclampsia, okay, I should limit the fluid to 80 milli per hour. Unless, unless she's having ongoing fluid losses. Or, of course, she's having acute kidney injury and now she's having acute failure. In this case, I'm going to use the agent of choice, hydralazine. Why? Because hydralazine is the agent that you can give. Volume expansion plus the hydralazine. This is one of a kind. You can give a crystalloid plus hydralazine. So usually we use the hydralazine in cases who are having severe preeclampsia with ongoing losses. Otherwise, you should not give a woman a preload. You should not give her fluids. This is very risky. You got it now, guys? You got why, why this scenario is very tricky? And I, I choose it for this. This scenario is going to make you revise all the hypertension critical care. Okay, so generally speaking, I'm not going to give a preload before giving uh, the antihypertensives or before uh, giving a low dose epidural analgesia during labor, like like the normal, like the normal. You know, in, in case of a normal lady, if she's having epidural or spinal uh, combined epidural anesthesia, we give her a preload. You know why? Anyone can guess why? What what risk of high potential in hypertension? High potential. Yes, epidural and spinal combined epidural analgesia can can do high potential. So normally, in normal patients, we give a preload. But here, with a woman with severe preeclampsia, do not give a preload. Do not give IV fluids unless balanced IV fluids. If needed, if needed, if you are going to give her hydralazine, this is the only indication for crystalloids. Because hydralazine can cause her severe sudden hypotension. So we are going to make a balance between them. So again, if I'm having a woman in practical care, what should I do? I should measure the blood pressure hourly. And if she's having a uh, blood pressure less than 160 over 110, I'm, I'm going to do Fifteen to thirty minutes measurement. Okay, the treatments I can use any of those according to the case. Take care. Labetalol can be given oral or IV. Nifedibin is only oral drug, so I'm going to keep in my mind that if a woman is having severe hypertension or severe preeclampsia, even if in the scenario they put me temptations for the usage of nifedipin. This is not my choice now. I, I need a quick agent. A quick agent would be labetalol or IV hydralazine. In this case that we, we had, let, let me go through it again. The woman could cannot have hydralazine. She cannot have hydralazine because of her cardiac state. You got it now? Uh, 
All good? Okay. So let's see this one. A woman attends assessment unit at 32 weeks, which by the way, yes, this is the time that we do assessment uh, just before the 36th appointment where we are going to plan for delivery. So here she's having uh, raised blood pressure. They didn't say how much. Okay, 152 over 102. Protein creat ratio is 32 milligram per millimole. So what do you think? Is this preeclampsia or just hypertension? Preeclampsia. Yes, okay. Because I'm having the ratio more than 30, right? Okay, great. Is this severe preeclampsia or not? No, it's not severe. It's not severe. So, this is what I was telling you at the very beginning. This question previously would be admit this woman. But now, with the new NICE guideline, we are not going to admit her. The new NICE guideline is much easier than the previous one. The previous one was classified into mild, moderate, severe. Now we have only, as you can see, preeclampsia with hypertension or severe hypertension. No mild, moderate, severe anymore. What, what, what we are going to do with someone with Hypertension, not severe preeclampsia. She is preeclampsia, but not severe preeclampsia. The hypertension is not severe. I'm going to admit her only if there is clinical concern for the woman or the baby, or she's having one of the adverse events suggested by the full peers. This is a production model. Okay, you are going to find it also individual summaries. The woman here is not having any risk factor. They didn't say anything. So I'm going to offer her pharmacological treatment. Right? And I'm going to have the, the aim for blood pressure, which is 135 over 85. How I'm going to monitor her? This would be every 48 hours. Dipstick proteinuria only if clinically indicated. The blood test would be twice a week. I would not offer her uh, the ultrasound uh, like, like previously. No, I'm going to offer her a diagnosis. And if it's normal, I'm going to repeat it every two weeks, like usual. CTG only if clinically indicated. This is new. This is different from before. Dipstick proteinuria only if clinically indicated. Only if new symptoms and signs develop. Only if you are uncertain of the diagnosis. So here, she can have the treatment by the community midwife. She does not need any admission. So A, B, and C are wrong. So which one of those is more correct, D or E? What do you think? Yeah, the, yeah, she's going to, to have the, the treatment. It's okay. But it's the best option here. Yeah, I know that Z does not mention treatment. Okay, but it's the single best answer here.
it's not perfect answer. It is the single best answer within the choices. You are not going to admit a woman with blood pressure less than 160 over 110. Okay, this is really important now. Unless she's having other risk factors. Okay, and th this is why hypertension uh, questions could be tricky. Okay, here we are having a patient with eclampsia received four gram of magnesium sulfate and IV maintenance one gram per hour. After a few hours, the patient convulsed it again. What should you do? Aren't you going to give her diazepam or phenytoin? So you all know it? Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes, repeat the polis. We are not going to use anti-epileptic drugs for eclampsia. Excellent, guys. And by the way, you should remember the dose because it, it can come as EMQ with so many numbers. We need a loading dose of 4 gram given intravenously over 5 to 15 minutes. Then the maintenance is going to be 1 gram per hour for 24 hours. If she's still having seizures, we are going to give further dose. The further dose is two to four grams, given over five to 15 minutes. So it's a quick, big dose. Okay, it's the same like loading dose or half. We, we usually start by two, and if she needs it again, we give her another two. If the, con the, the, the convulsion stay, we are going to give her another two. This is why we are saying over 5 to 15 minutes. Yes, yes, dear sir. We do not use diazepam, phenytoin, or any other anticonvulsants. Okay. This is great. Okay. Here we are. The woman is admitted at 33 weeks. Take care of every detail. She's vomiting. She's having severe preeclampsia. She's asthmatic. She's taking salbutamol and steroids. See, the details are really important. Why? Because this means she's having severe asthma. She's using two agents, salbutamol and steroids. Her blood pressure is 170 over 110. This is why she's admitted. The urine output is 140 milli in the last four hours. Someone please, please tell me quickly, is this normal or abnormal? If she is average adult, so we are talking about like 70 kilograms, what, what should be her urine output in, in the last hour? Yeah, like 30 to 35 in in one hour. Okay, so four hours multiply 30, 140 milliliter. Okay, so this is accepted. Accepted so far. Okay, her platelet count is 100. She appears well. Her deep tendon reflexes are normal. They are telling you this woman is not going to have eclampsia soon. Right? So I, I need you to choose the best agent for her to control the hypertension. Remember what I told you before? She's vomiting. So of course I'm 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 going to omit any oral choice here. Okay, and the woman is not having any overload. She's not edematous. She's not eclamptic.
I'm having correct answers, but someone said oral nifadipin, like really. She's vomiting. So I'm having, forget about A, forget about B, forget about C. Now D, intravenous hydralazine. Okay, I'm going to keep it in my mind. Okay, intravenous labitalol. No, she's asthmatic. F, intravenous magnesium sulfate. No, she's not eclamptic. G, no. H, no. I, no. J, of course not. K, uh, what is this? Of course not. Anyway, I'm not going to give her a preload than epidural. So I'm, I'm left with D, intravenous hydralazine. And M. Which one is better? I I got many correct answers, mashallah, which is L, of course. Yes. However, D is not incorrect. This is what I was telling you. In EMQ, please, please go through all the options. You might find the, the correct one. But usually they are putting the correct answer at the very, very bottom of the option. Like the last one. So yes, L would be the correct one. This trick, by the way, is very famous. They, they do it especially in obstetrics. Especially speaking. Yeah, yeah, yes, dear. You know why? Because hydralazine is going to make her lose the extra fluids. Hydralazine is not giving alone. We should give her crystalloids with hydralazine or before it. They said she's having severe treatment here. They said it already. And you know why they, they mentioned the urine output and the platelet count and so on? So you don't think about health. So you don't think about eclampsia. Okay? So this is like a rule. When you use hydralazine, you are going to give crystalloids with it. Hydralazine alone can cause severe acute hypotension. This is the only agent that you would give her crystalloid with. The only one. Dr. Benita, you didn't get uh, the, the question or you didn't get when I was saying, be aware that the correct option could be the last one. Could be the last one to so make sure you have read all the options. Okay, and I think if I'm not wrong, this is a kanji question or Dr. Andrew. Okay, here we are. The, he is telling you that hydrazine is a vasodilator, a potent one, by the way. Okay, so it must be preceded by intravenous load preload. Levitalol is contraindicated because the woman is asthmatic. Okay, nifedipine is okay, of course, but the woman is vomiting. Nifedipine is oral drug. So this is why we are not going to give her nifedipine. And also, in such case, when, when we are having a, a, a severe, a severe preeclampsia, usually are going to use IV drugs. Okay? Yes, again, I'm, I'm reminding you here. This is going to be an exception for hydralazine. Usually, we are not going to use volume expansion. Of course, in severe preeclampsia, we do 
limitation of fluid. Why not magnesium sulfate? Because she's not a clamped. They, they said in the scenario that the deep tendon reflexes are okay. She is not ha having hyperreflexia, which is one of the eminent signs of eclampsia. Okay, I think, yes, th this was the last question for today. And uh, thank you so, so much, guys, for attending. And thank you for bearing me and waiting for me all this. Uh, I'm, I'm so sorry for the delay. I I hope, I hope that we cover some of the tricky points as much as I can. Uh, keep answering the questions that Dr. Madinji is posting in Facebook or Telegram, please. You're going to be very helpful. And if you feel that anything is really conflicting for you the group is open okay and I, I really like discussions take care everyone you have a lovely night thank you thank you thank you you are the lovely one see you soon inshallah okay and uh, i was preparing uh, a revision note for epilepsy i i wish you would like it inshallah thank you so much and see you soon السلام عليكم